again looking at the uh, third commandment tonight, and uh, I'll read the, uh, the question, and if you'd responsibly read back the answer to me. So Lord's Day 36, what is God's will for us in the third commandment? That we neither blaspheme nor misuse the name of God by cursing, perjury, or unnecessary oaths nor share in such horrible sins by being silent bystanders. In a word, it requires that we use the holy name of God only with reverence and awe so that we may properly confess him, pray to him, and praise him in everything we do and say. Is blasphemy of God's name by swearing and cursing really such serious sin that God is angry also with those who do not do all they can to help prevent it and to forbid it. Yes, indeed. No sin is greater. No sin makes God more angry than blaspheming his name. That is why he commanded the death penalty for it. All right. Um, and then, if you would turn again with me to uh, 1 Samuel 17. And I'm going to read uh, verses 31 through 47. So David has come into the valley of Elah. He's brought some food. And he has come in just in time to hear Goliath and his pompous words. And now he, 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 what he did is he started talking to some of the different soldiers about what's going on. And they're telling them what's going on. And they're also telling them that there's an opportunity for any man that will actually kill this man. And, uh, but David really comes off, he is incensed, he's, he's just a young guy, in fact, one of the things about David is that they believe that, I mean, he doesn't even have a beard yet, so he's just a fresh-faced boy, he's probably 16, 17, 18 years old, he doesn't even have a beard yet, he's not even a full-grown man, and uh, so he comes, and he hears this man, and he's just, his whole person is pretty, pretty, upset about how this man is speaking against the armies of the living God. And, uh, but as he questions some of the people, his, one of his older brothers kind of dogs him out, tells him that he knows about his pride and his arrogance, etc. Uh, but then um, in verse 31, it says that, Now when the words which David spoke were heard, they reported them to Saul, and he sent for him. Then David said to Saul, Let no man's heart fail because of him. Your servant will go and fight with this Philistine. And Saul said to David, You are not able to go up against this Philistine to fight with him, for you are youth, and he is a man of war from his youth. But David said to Saul, Your servant used to keep his father's sheep, and when a lion or a bear came and took a lamb out of the flock, I went after it and struck it. I went out after it and struck it and delivered the lamb from its mouth. And when it rose against me, I caught it by its beard and struck and killed it. Your servant has killed both lion and bear, and this uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them, seeing seeing that he has defied the armies of the living God. Moreover, David said, The Lord, who delivered me from the paw of the lion and from the paw of the bear, he will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. And Saul said to David, Go, and the Lord be with you. So Saul clothed David with his armor, and he put a bronze helmet on his head, and he also clothed him with a coat of mail. David fastened his sword to his armor and tried to walk, for he had not tested them. And David said to Saul, I cannot walk with these, for I have not tested them. So David took them off. Then he took his staff in his hand, and he chose for himself five smooth stones from the brook, and he put them in a shepherd's bag, in a pouch which he had, and his sling was in his hand, and he drew near to the Philistine. So the Philistine came and began drawing near to David, and, and the man bore the shield. who bore the shield went before him. And when the Philistine looked about and saw David, he disdained him, for he was only a youth, ruddy and good-looking. So the Philistine said to David, Am I a dog that you come to me with sticks? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. And the Philistine said to David, Come to me, and I will give your flesh to the birds of the air and to the beasts of the field. Then David said to the Philistine, You come to me with a sword, with a spear, and with a javelin. But I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This day the Lord will deliver you into my hand, and I will strike you and take your head from you. And this day I will give the the carcasses of the camp of the Philistines 
to the birds of the air and to the wild beasts of the earth, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. Then all this assembly shall know that the Lord does not save with sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hands. Thus ends the reading of God's word. Let's ask, ask his blessing on his word. Father, again, having read your holy, infallible, and inspired word, we pray that you'd bring forth a good word, that you would be with me, that you'd be with the words of my mouth, the meditation of my heart, that you'd bring it forth in a way that is pleasing to you. But Father, we pray too that you'd be with each one here present, each one listening, that you would strengthen them, uphold them, and, 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 and that those who already know you would, would be encouraged by your words, and those that do not yet know you, Father, we pray, have mercy, open their hearts and turn them to believe in the one King of kings, the one Lord of lords, and the one Savior of mankind. All these things we ask in Jesus' name alone. Amen. So tonight we're looking at uh, Lord's Day 36, which is speaking of the third commandment, the third word, so to speak. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. And, and of course, the, the catechism is focused on um, using the name of God lightly or in a way that is, is, is not right. And what we see that, that even today, brothers and sisters, um, that the name of God, the name of Jesus Christ in this country is horrifyingly blasphemed. I mean, it's just a fact. It's a reality. And... Uh, one, I think it's one of the great signs that we're living in a very lawless age because unfortunately, because of television, because of the media, because of all the things that people watch, we have children as young as five, six years old all the way up to the oldest of people cursing and using the name of God and using the name of Jesus Christ in, in just a terrible way. And it seems like the only thing in this nation that the, the name of God is good for is either to use it to curse somebody or to express strong emotion. Oh my God, right? And that's what we actually hear from so many, so many of these children already, six, seven, eight years old. You go to the mall and listen, you keep your ears open, you'll hear it. You'll hear children just, you know, using that name and just throwing it around as if it's nothing. And the truth is, is that in America today, there are more people that are afraid when a black cat walks in front of them, then they are of using the name of God lightly. That's a fact. That's a reality. It's a terrible thing. That the living God, who will have vengeance, is so lightly treated by so many. And I pray that we listen to this and that both young people and their parents would be warned against taking the name of God in their mouths in an empty and in a vain way. The consequences will be terrible. However, brothers and sisters, I don't believe that the third commandment is actually focused on that near as much as we think. Because the language in the Hebrew, it does not say that you shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. In the Hebrew, it's very clear. It uses a word that means to lift up. It's the word nisah, and the word Nassah means to lift up, to bear, or to carry. You shall not lift up or bear or carry the name of God in a vain and, and a light way. So in uh, Exodus 19, verse 4, which is, is, is just a, a few verses before we get to chapter 20, where we have the law of God, it says, God said, you have seen what I did to the Egyptians and how I bore you, and that's that same word, on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. And so he uses this word to describe how he carried them on his back, how he took them out of Egypt, and he bore and he carried them to the mountain of God. And so now he's telling his people, I don't want you to lift up to bear, I don't want you to bear or carry my name in a light, in a vain way. So the third commandment speaks of something far deeper than just taking the name of God in a bad way in your mouth. That's included, of course. But the essence of the third commandment is how we carry the name of God in our life. 
That's the essence of the third commandment. And, and when you look at that, then you see, too, that um, when you hear all these people that are using the name of God lightly around us, one of the things you have to understand and I have to understand is that you should just do a silent prayer for them, but the consequences are far worse for us than it is for them. Many of them don't know God. Many of these young people that are using this name so lightly, they're not being raised in the church. They're not being called Christian. That's us. We are Christians. We are the ones who bear and carry the name of God. So this commandment speaks to his people. It speaks to those who confess his name. And what, and what I believe that it's, it's very clear, that's what, what's being said is that, that when we do not conduct ourselves in an upright way, when we do not conduct ourselves either by our speech or our behavior in a way that honors or praises God, Right, So you have a, a man who claims he's a Christian and, and he confesses Christianity, he's, he's in business and he's at the coffee shop and he's bragging to his buddies about how, what he, how somebody wronged him in business but how he got him back. How he turned it around and, and, and he played a game on this guy and got it back. Guess what? He just broke the third commandment because that's exactly what the third commandment's about. You're a Christian. We must be willing to suffer wrong. We do not return evil for evil. And that is the heart of the third commandment. That is the essence of what God is asking his people to do. In the third commandment, we are to lift up and carry the name of God in a way that honors him, that glorifies him. And so today, or tonight, I'd like us to look at how David bears or carries the name of God as he goes into battle against Goliath, and we'll look very briefly at that. First of all, Saul's rejection and confusion. Second, rejecting Saul's armor. And third, putting on the armor of God's name. First of all, the, the, uh, Saul's rejection and confusion. The background of this story is that God had, had, had given Saul and had chosen Saul to be the king over Israel, God's king, God's anointed king. And if you go back, you'll find out that God put his Holy Spirit on him. He gave him a spirit of wisdom, a spirit of knowledge, a spirit of understanding. He gave him the ability to lead this people in the way that God called them to lead them. But what we find is that Saul, even though he has the Spirit of God, which is a very powerful indictment against him, because the Spirit of God is telling him what he needs to be doing, but he's not listening. And so when, when the prophet Samuel comes to him and says, I want you to do this, right? And he's speaking the words of God. God says, I want you to go do this. And then he doesn't do it. Or he does it in a way that, that does not honor God. Um, he tells him to, to, to go attack a, a certain people, the, the Amalekites, and destroy them, and destroy all their sheep, and destroy all their herds. But of course, they get there, and, and those guys, being just like a bunch of good Dutchmen, Right? They're looking at it, and they, they win the battle, and, and then they look at all, these, all this cattle, and they're like, you know, there's nothing really wrong with this cattle. You know, I mean, there's, these are good cattle, good sheep, good, you know, why should we destroy them? It can't be God's will. But of course, it was God's will. But Saul was in charge. Saul was the king, and he didn't do it. He disobeyed. He thought he knew better than God. And so here he is, the, the, the king of God's people, and he's supposed to be leading them in faith and obedience, but he's not doing it. And so that brings us to this situation, right? God takes his, God at a certain point in, in, verse, in chapter 15, he, he comes to Saul, right? Samuel comes to Saul and, and tells him that what you've done God is going to tear the kingdom out of your hands now. He's going to give the kingdom to a neighbor of yours who is better than you. Someone who has a heart after God's own heart. Somebody that will actually honor God. That he will live and, and conduct himself in a way that is honoring to the name of God. So that's where Saul is. 
He's lost. He's a, he's a lost and, and, and confused king. He's a baffled king, right? He's sitting there, and he's at this battle now, and he's got all these soldiers, and he's got the Philistines on the other side, and he's stuck because he doesn't know what to do. He, he doesn't know how to go against this monster because really, you know, kind of a modern picture is in, uh, I think it was in 1939, September of 1939, uh, if you go back and study this, you'll actually find this a real event that when the, when the Germans went into Poland, they had the last battle against horse cavalry with tanks. And of course, a tank against horses, you know what? You could have 3,000 horses run around one tank, and they're not going to take that tank down. That tank is supreme. There is nothing those horses can do to that tank. Well, this is what Goliath looks like. He looks like a tank on a battlefield where there's no other tanks. He looks like a completely invincible person. And Saul has no heart. He has no faith. He has no strength. He has no confidence in God because God has left him. Why? Because he didn't honor God. He didn't carry the name. He did not lift up and bear it in a name that was, in a way that was honorable to God. And so now the baffled king sits on the, on the, on the, on the battlefield and he doesn't know what to do. And his men line up and there's undoubtedly men that came to him and said, I'll go out and I'll go out. But they'd had no confidence until David comes. So that's, that's kind of just a short background on it. But then we see David being called before the king. And at first the king looks at him and says, just no way, right? There's no way. Because Saul himself was, it said, if you go back and look, I think it's in chapter 8, it, it talks about how tall he was. He was like a head and shoulders above all the men of Israel. He was a big man, probably at least six and a half foot tall or so. And, and he's looking down at David, and David's probably, my guess is 5'8", five, 5'9". Five, he's about the average of a, of a, of a, of a Jewish, Jewish man at that time. They, no, nobody's talking about how big David is, right? And he's looking at him, and he's young. He's boyish looking. He's like, you can't do this. He, undoubtedly, he likes his heart. Undoubtedly, he likes his courage, but he's like, you, you can't do this. But David, by the grace of God and the Spirit of God, is able to convince him. To, he's able to convince him that he is able to go out against this man, that he has killed a lion, he has killed a bear, he has defended the flock. So Saul says, okay, let's do it. He says, but you can't go out there like that. You have to put on this armor. So he gives him his own armor, and he dresses him up. He clothed him with his armor. He put on a bronze helmet on his head. He clothed him with a, a coat of mail, and, and he fastened the sword to his armor and tried to walk. Very interesting, right? Because think about it. This is the same armor that Saul will not go out on ba to battle with. Right? But you got to have this armor. I'm not going to go out there with it, but you can. That's what he's telling them. But, but then it says that, that, he says, I haven't tested it. It's very interesting, too, by the way. I don't think it's any accident that the word for testing is the word nisa. It's the almost exact same word, and it sounds exactly the same as the one that we have in the third commandment. It's got a different, believe it or not, I don't know, some weird, every language has weird stuff, right? So Hebrew has two S's. And this is one S and a different S, right? So they're different words. One means to lift up, to bear, and to carry. This one means to test. But I believe that the Word of God, the Spirit of God, is actually giving us an insight into the fact of what lifting up, bearing, and carrying the name of God is really all about. He's like, I haven't tested this. I, I can't even walk in it. But, but what it's really saying is that he puts on this armor and his confidence is not in the armor. 
And this is not, I, I can't win with this. I, this is not how I'm going to win. So he takes it off. And then he gets his slingshot and his five smooth stones, etc. But brothers and sisters, that is not the winning thing. That's not what wins the battle. Because David, by the grace of God, and by the Spirit of God, knows exactly what he needs out on that battlefield. He needs one thing. He, named, he needs the name of God. God alone is going to win this battle. And he knows it. He says it too, right? He goes on, he, he it describes how he, he gets his stones and then he drew near to the Philistine. And a Philistine came and he's drawing near. The man who bore the shield went before him. The guy's got a, not only is this guy completely, uh, you know, he's completely covered in armor, but he also has an armor bearer in front of him. Right? That's the whole idea of invincible. He sees David and David's, you know, dressed in a little robe, right? His, his little regular robe probably and he doesn't even have a sword on, doesn't have a helmet on, doesn't have any of that stuff. And this is why he laughs. This is a joke. After 40 days, this is what you're going to send me? You're going to send, you know, dogs out to me here? He says, am I a dog that you come to me with sticks? He looks at this man and he, and he disdains him. He has, he has no appreciation at all. Why? Well, brothers and sisters, it's because what do we see in the world? In the world, we look at how prepared you look to be. But God doesn't fight that way. He fights through the inside, through faith. He curses them. Verse 45, this is the real armor of God. David said to the Philistine, you come to me with a sword, with a spear, and with a javelin. But I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. I come to you in the name of the Lord God of Israel. Brothers and sisters, that's bearing the name. That's bearing the name. I don't care how fast he is, how quick he is, how good he is with that slingshot. Without this name, he loses. But why can't anybody else go out with that name? Because David represents our Lord Jesus Christ. He goes out with what I believe at this moment is a perfectly pure heart. He goes out with complete, 100% confidence in the name of the living God. That's the difference. Because if he goes out with half of it, if he goes out filled with, with all his regular fears and everything else, and, and I hope God hears me, I'm, I'm pretty sure he's up there, but I don't know if he's watching over me, I don't know if he's looking over me. Uh-uh. David comes with 100% confidence that Israel is the Israel of God. Israel is the beloved of God. Israel is in a covenant with God. God has made promises to us. He will defend us. He is our shield. He is our protection. He is our keeper. God is going to fight for us today. And he goes out there with 100% confidence. And, and you, can't, you can't fake that. I mean, you can try to fake that, but it's kind of like in the, in the New Testament. It, it talks about the man who's who's casting out demons. He's casting out demons, and all of a sudden he meets a demon that, that overpowers him and rips all his clothes off. He says, you know, Jesus I know, and Paul I know, but you, who are you? Who am I? I'm, I'm a guy that's coming up because I saw other people do it, and I heard him say some words and some names, and now I'm coming in my own, in my own strength. Get out of here. You're not going to make it. It is not enough to just say we believe in God. It's not enough to just come to church. The giving of our tithes, etc. 
You have to believe with all your heart, mind, and soul that God lives. That Jesus Christ has died on that cross and rose again from the dead. That Jesus Christ is the captain of our salvation. That he has all power in heaven and on earth. And then you can go out with confidence. Not in your own flesh. Never in your own flesh. And David is not going out in his flesh. He's going out in the name of the living God and he is bearing it the way that God wants him to. He represents God and he speaks and he says, I'm not doing it. I come to you in the name of the Lord God of Israel. And it's pure. And it's the winning combination. In Ephesians chapter 6, Verse 13, therefore take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. Stand therefore having girded your waist with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith with which you will be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one. This is someone who knows and believes with all their heart, mind, soul, and strength who Jesus Christ is, what has been done, and what we're being called to do. And he goes out not in his own strength, not in his own name, not in his own power, but he stands taking the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. You know, Jesus was naked on the cross. That's a fact. And it's, when you first grasp that, it's disturbing. But he met all our foes. He met Satan. He met the world. He met all human evilness, and he met the wrath of God itself with no human armament. But one thing, the name of God himself. Trusting and believing 100% in the word of God. That's the only way you can do it. Brothers and sisters, one of the things that I think that Christians should always be doing is looking in the mirror. We should always be examining ourselves. We should always be asking, am I doing what God's calling me to do? Am I representing his name? Am I representing his name both in my conduct and in my speech in a way that is, that is, that is upright, in a way that is pleasing to him? And one of the beautiful things that I love about the cross and I love about the word of God and what the gospel tells me I fail all the time. I do. I trip. I stumble. But what I love about the Word of God is He says, get up. Just humble yourself. Repent. Lord, I'm sorry. I blew it there. I did not speak in a way that was honorable to you. I'm sorry. Now I'm asking you to give me what I need and I'm going to keep going. And I pray that the next time I'll have learned from this time and I will trust in you, I'll trust in your name, I'll trust in your word, I'll trust in your love, I'll trust in your spirit, I'll trust in your power. That's what it means to lift up, to bear, or to carry the name of God. And the word of God tells us to do it with joy. Do it with joy. I, I just, I love that, you know. I grew up in a background, too, that we had grim faces. We went to battle, mostly with other Christians, right? And we did it, and we did it, and, and, and there, was this, there was anger there. There's just all these different things here that, that are not actually what the gospel is telling us to do. One of the beautiful things is, is again and again and again, and, and David writes so many of the Psalms, rejoice do it with praise do it with joy do it understanding what god has done for me 
and what he's doing in me. True love in Christ should bring forth joy and rejoicing and praise in our hearts. And if we lack that, again, just ask. God, I believe, I trust, but I'm missing the joy. There's something not quite right here, so please give me what I need. Because I know one thing, that if you grab people by the throat and you say, believe or else, generally they're going to punch you in the face. I'm just saying. Joy in confessing the name of God. Honesty, truthfulness, faithfulness, love, compassion. That's what God desires from us as we go forward day by day bearing his name. Amen. For you this evening hour, and we thank you. We thank you for your word and your spirit. And-